John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You can be seated. Uh, we find that today's day and age, we find people find freedom in a lot of things, whether it's the bottom of a bottle, <laughs> the bottom of a bong, <laughs> uh, drugs, alcohol, um, entertainment, lifestyle, hobbies. But there's only one thing that makes you truly free, and that is the truth. The Bible says in Acts 17 and 30, and at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. God looked past a lot of things, and God uh, allowed some things to go because he knew what he was fixing to do. Uh, but one of the things that is important is repentance. Now, Hosea, one of the minor prophets, makes a statement in Hosea 4 and 6. He says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. Well, when we talk about knowledge, and I wasn't the best student. Uh, you know, I'm married to a teacher, but that doesn't necessarily make you a good student. But you need to be a student to be saved. Ephesians chapter 4, and this is before we'll get to talk about the Ephesians later and when we get into an incident in Acts chapter 19. The Bible says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's the church. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. We're all at a different spot. We're all at a different place. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'm to be growing to be like Jesus. I'm, I need the preaching. I need teaching. I need study. I need to be a student of the word. Now, honestly, a lot of people today uh, no longer feel that they need to know anything. Case in point, not to get political, but to make a point. This, this, this election has a lot of young people willing to vote away their constitutional rights. All for the sake of some other ideology. Now listen, if, you have, if you're doing it now and you're about to vote to diminish the things, you better stop and think about it for a minute. It's what made this country great to begin with for you to stand up and bellyache now. But you vote enough, you're not even going to be allowed to bellyache. You better be listening to me. And people don't understand that you need your constitution to be an American. I'm going to tell you something. You need the Bible to be a saint of God. And you better know what it says. Okay, going again. I'm going to go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Read two verses here. But there were also, there were false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall also be teachers, false teachers among you. We know you can go to some stories in the Old Testament that talk about people that want to prophesy against the people of God. And God said, uh-uh. You need to know what it says there. But there's going to be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, false teaching, stuff that's not really the word of God. So just know everything you're hearing isn't true. How do you know it's true? You got a Bible? You better grab your Bible. Are you hearing me? Even denying, listen to this, he put even there. Even denying the Lord that bought them. And bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Anybody ever catch in a little H -E double hockey stick because you're sticking with the truth? Because you're sticking with the word of God? Hey, count it all joy when you suffer persecution, right? So I want to talk a little bit how, how to know you're saved. We got a little silent in here. Got a little, oh. How many know you're saved? 
You better know the scriptures. Okay? You can know if you have knowledge. Now, in the book of John, he uses a, a, a several words in his epistles to illustrate his point that real spiritual knowledge always involves obeying the word of God. Uh, this is not original with me, but a novelist, Lloyd Douglas, tells about a man who went to visit his old violin teacher. And he walked in and hey, what's new? The teacher in a frustrated manner says, I'll tell you what's new. He grabbed a tuning fork and he banged it and that tuning fork vibrating at 440 cycles per second vibrated an A note which came out loud and clear. He said, do you hear that? That's an A, he proclaimed. Now upstairs, I have a soprano that's rehearsing endlessly and she's always off key. Next door, I've got a cello player who plays his instrument poorly. There's an out-of-tune piano on the other side of me, and I'm surrounded by terrible noise night and day. Plunking that tuning fork again, he said, that's an A. It's an A today. It'll be an A tomorrow. It'll never change. What's he saying? Truth is truth. It won't change, and truth has no versions. John 14 and 6 declares, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. Come on, y'all sound like a bunch of lily liver. Come on, it's the what? The truth and the life. We live in a very subjective world where people tend to base everything on how they feel. <laughs> yeah. Everyone is an authority because they're basing on how they feel. Well, this is how I feel. Luke 44 tells us, and Jesus answered him saying, it is written. Now understand, Jesus had been fasting. Jesus is now dealing with the devil himself. But even in that state, he says, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. It is absolutely crucial for you and I to not base our eternal salvation on feeling. Insert an amen right there, because you should believe that. The Holy Ghost is vital for salvation. John writes in John chapter 14, verse 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth them not, neither knoweth. Everybody say knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That's more than a feeling. That's words. That's knowledge. That's truth. So, if you're getting on an airplane, I don't know about you, but I want more than a feeling that it's going to fly. I want to know that the pilot and the air traffic controllers, the mechanics, the guy fueling the thing that are doing it by the book. <laughs> Salvation is the same way. We must find our A note in God's word. We have to evaluate our, our spiritual experience by the word of God. I'm not leaving my soul in the hands of guesswork. All right? Simply put, there is something we can do so we can know that we are saved. And that is keep the commandments of the word of God. There's also something God will do so that we will know that we are saved. And that is filling us with his spirit. There's a knowing here. There's knowledge here. Have you ever heard people say this? Well, I don't see it like you do. Come on, I don't mind getting sticky. I don't mind getting sticky at all. I don't see it like you do. 
my interpretation is as valid as yours, so we'll just agree to disagree. But that's not what the apostles did. That's not what the disciples did, because though it sounds logical and it sounds right and it really fits in today's day and age, that's not how the apostles dealt with it. In fact, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation. We don't define scripture. Scripture defines scripture. Write that down. Are you hearing me? For the prophecy came not in old time by came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful he still does it today. John lived the longest of the 12 apostles, and he saw the ebb and flow of the New Testament church to the end of the first century along with the great revival he also saw some doctrinal errors that began to creep into the church anybody play that game called gossip you start at one end with a phrase and by the time you get to the end it's all changed up aren't you glad God had it written down mm -hmm. now John as he wrote he wrote against uh, a group called the Gnostics the word Gnostic comes from the Greek word for knowledge the group claimed extra extra biblical revelation and we're fascinated with the unseen spirit world the hierarchies of angels now listen on the surface it's really easy to say you know something about what can't what's not written and can't be seen did you hear me because there's no proof that's why a lot of churches don't want to preach getting the holy ghost that's why a lot because the holy ghost is the manifestation whereby we know mm-hmm they said, you're not spiritual. These, guys, these Gnostics said, you're not spiritual enough unless you buy into their so-called secret knowledge and their, 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 their way of the world and their principalities and their powers. Well, you don't know. You're not as spiritual as us. Paul warned uh, Colossians against such knowledge in Colossians 2 and 18. Let no man beguile you. That's what Satan did to Eve. Beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Careful people walking around being super spiritual. Let me tell you how to handle that. If it's not in the word, you go do your thing, but I'm not buying that stuff here. Are you hearing me? Another verse says, don't be cheated by people who make a show of acting humble who worship angels. They brag about seeing visions, but it's all nonsense because their minds are filled with selfish desires. Be careful when you start following these big shots, celebrities. Be careful when you get behind following fads and fashions because the Gnostics look down on the apostles and the Bible-based Christians. They pride in themselves of their secret knowledge or deeper understanding of deeper things of the Spirit. The Spirit will not lead you to do something that violates His Word. Okay? We don't need any more Jim Jones. If you don't know who that is, Google it. Or ask some of the older folks around here. 1 Corinthians 14.33 declares, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all church of the saints. That's 1 Corinthians 14.33. I'd admonish some of you who've got a divided home. Go read the rest of that. Go read that. Gnosticism led people beyond the sure foundation of Scripture and into a place of persuasive personalities. We got a lot of religious persuasive personalities. Uh, are you hearing what I'm saying? And they, they cause what we call subjective experiences. We live in a world today where you can't question someone's experience. Well, I, well, I, well, that's wonderful, but show me the word. This is my foundation. This is what I'm going to come back to. If you go to the court of law, they're not going to go, well, so-and-so say, what's, what's the law say? Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's why God gave us his word. Because it doesn't matter how hard someone argues, if it violates God's word, it's not right. 
God is not the author of confusion. Grab that Bible. Hold on to that Bible. Know what it says. The Bible talks about people being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And Paul warned that this was coming, folks. He told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, for the time will come. Well, they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, tell me what I want to hear. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That's sad. Because while I know there's a lot of people out there that don't want the truth, they reject the truth, they want to do their own thing, there's a lot of people out there that want the truth and they bought into something because they were told it's the truth. That's why I'll tell you right now, hearing this now, you need to be a Bible reader. You need to study the Word. You need to study the show of thyself for proof. I'm not afraid of people that know their Bible. I'm not afraid of people that read their Bible. Now, I understand the apostolic church and our worship is emotional, and I'm glad that it is. But it also involves the mind, the will, and the word. Even David danced before the Lord with all his might. I get it. Sometimes people are going to run because they want to run. Run! Some people are out there dancing some ridiculousness, going to parties and raves, doing all sorts of dumb stuff. Hey, I'm here to worship God even with my own might. I'm going to put my energies into it. Because he said, when he talk about the time will come, John says, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So we need the spirit and we need the truth. They govern one another. Are you here? We want the word of God to be a How do you know someone's got the Holy Ghost according to the word of God? We'll, we'll get into that. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. As truth-loving apostolics, our openness to experience, because we've all been around people, can also make us pray or susceptible to novelty. Damn, man, did you hear about over here? You... That's why we've got to be Bible-based. If the Spirit's moving there, it's going to be, it's going to coincide with the truth. Amen. God does not want us subjected to confusion. We have the word. 1 John verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try or test the spirits, whether they are of God. Men, because many false prophets are gone out of the Find out. Oh, the Spirit of God's moving there? Great. Are they preaching truth? Are they teaching truth? I'm not going to say that the Spirit won't touch a place or move in a place. Hello? But hey, I'll be honest. Sometimes the Spirit's moving in my life, but I got a bad attitude and I need to get straightened out. So I'm not going to just have all Spirit and no truth and all truth and no Spirit. We need to find that balance. Test and try. Line up their life next to God's word. It's funny, we got preachers and teachers in great big gigantic facilities around the world where thousands flock to. You very rarely hear them tell people to repent. You'll very rarely hear them, you got to change your life. They're telling me, just like you are. Because, look, they got to afford what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So John uses several play on words in his epistle to illustrate his point that real spiritual knowledge always involves obeying the word of God. 1 John 2, 3, and 5, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. This is New Testament, folks. Commandments. Everybody say commandments. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I'm not going to get into this Bible study. It's another one of those things I could have went off on. I'm not going off on that today. But understand, God still has commands in the New Testament today. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, 
In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. How do you know? How do you know? Do I, should I teach that? Anybody over here know? Anybody over here? Nope. No, anybody over here? Thank you. So we got one. Keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. Everybody say, keep the commandments. In other words, I need to know the word of God and what I'm asked to do. I need to know what the Bible says and what I should be doing because today it's very easy to start living in the flesh, to please the flesh. Amen. I'll come and I'll get spiritual for five minutes on a Wednesday or a Sunday, but after that I'm ungoverned. How do you know that you're in him? How do you know you're saved? You keep his commandments. 1 John 4, 13. Hereby know we that, that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us his spirit. When's the last time you exercised the gift of the Holy Ghost and stirred up that gift that is in you? If it's been a little while, something's wrong. If it's been some time, hey, something ain't right there. Stir it up. Sometimes it takes the preaching to stir it up. Take that Facebook, turn it off, throw the phone down, put the games away, get in the presence of God, stir it up. Why? Because that's what the truth says. You got a wife not living right, you got a husband not living right, you better talk about the word. You better talk about the truth. You better talk about the spirit. You say, hey, wait a minute, this can't be this way. So simply speaking, there's something that we can do so that we can know that we're saved, and that is keep the commandments of the word of God. Also, there's something God will do so that we know, and I said it before and I'll say it again, that we're saved, and that is filling us with his spirit. It's kind of like the, the five wise and the five foolish. The five foolish had no oil. How, how long has it been since your oil's been topped up? It's a sad day we take better care of our cars than we do our spiritual walk with God. We take better care of our cars than our family members. When's the last time you've gone up to your spouse or your children or your grandchildren or whoever it is? Hey, when's the last time you? Oh, that creates a stickiness. Boy, you better embrace that stickiness and get rid of the stick and get rid of the confusion. Say, so, hey, I know. We get the word know from the word knowledge. Acts 1 and 8, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witness unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all, in all Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. He's talking about the Holy Ghost. He's talking about the power of God to be a You can't be a witness without the Holy Ghost. I could read Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. If you don't know that, go read that. Then catch up with us. I'm moving on. Here's one thing I have trouble knowing for sure. I'm not perfect. Can I get an amen from over here? And the word of God and my wife agrees with me. It's a good club, brother. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every human is born with a lifetime account with God. Every one of us has that account. I know you care more about your Amazon account or your bank account or whatever kind of account you got. But I'm going to tell you something. You got an account with God. Because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, we all have that account. Every person's life begins with that account immediately corrupted by sin. Listen, folks. We only have two choices regarding sin. We can wait until after death. And beg for the best. Or we can deal with our sin now. Like the Bible instructs. And not deciding is deciding. Are you hear what I'm saying? I always say it like this. If you ask a lady to marry and she says not now. It's still a no. <laughs> because understand what is at stake. It's your eternity and tomorrow may be too late. A not now is a no. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 to 20 says, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Mm -hmm. So 
Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I don't know about you, but I want Jesus to be the Savior mm -hmm. from my sins. I need Jesus in my life. John said in John chapter 3, verse 7, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Tell your neighbor, you got to be born again. And then you got to renew that and stir that up. Whoever wants to go to heaven must be born again. It's not a suggestion. It's not a might be nice. It says must. Now listen, you're born twice, you die once. If you're only born once, you die twice. If you don't believe me, Revelation 2 and 11 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. It's church people. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Revelation 20, 15. And whosoever, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Hey, church. You got to be born again. You must be born again. I know a lot of people don't want to take church important, but I'm going to tell you something. You must be born again. They ain't doing this down at Target. They're not going to do this down at the football stadium. They're not going to talk to you about this or whatever activity you think is so important. There will be something about us that you know what? The Bible talks about Hebrew 10, 25, about even the more as you see a day, but why? we got to be born again. we got to be born again. I need to be walking in truth and the spirit. Spirit and truth, truth and spirit. Spirit. I need to be praying through in the Holy Ghost. I need to be getting in the word of God. I need to know what it says. I can't walk around like a fool or an idiot not knowing what it says. We ought to read it so, you know, wait a minute, I, bet, I haven't done that in a while. I better pray through. I better get that stir up that gift that's within me. I need to know what the truth says. I'm walking blindly. I don't think it's important that I'm at church. I don't think it's important that I got a prayer life. It ought to alarm you during prayer if you can just sit there. Because if you ain't got enough urgency to pray here, don't you dare tell me you're praying at home. Even Paul told Timothy how to behave himself in the house of God. There's a conduct here that every, especially the elders, should have. There ought to be an urgency about us. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. I need to stir it up, God, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And the word is not in us. Don't tell me you can walk in here and not get down on your face and pray. Don't tell me you don't need to get pray through in the Holy Ghost. Speaking with other tongues, you better stir up that gift. You better stir up that gift or you're going to be like those five foolish. He's going to show up and you let the oil run out. The oil run out because, yeah, I can understand you used it, but you stopped using it. You let it run out and you didn't care. How many likes letting their gas run out of their gas tank so that they're dead on the side of the road? If you did that every week at some point, I, I mean, I, forgive me, but I'm going to call you. You're an idiot. Why, why would you make life so much harder on you? Why would you not check your oil? Why would you not do regular maintenance? Why would you not do upkeep? We do it on our cars and our house. God, we would throw a fit if our refrigerator went out or our washer or dryer went out or if our car went out. We'd be up sideways with our life over that. But yet we turn around and treat our spiritual life like there's an enemy behind that. There's an enemy behind that. So the question is, how do I deal with my sins now? Anybody? John told us that we need to keep the commandments of God and let God fill us with his spirit. So what are God's commands regarding salvation? What's command number one? Repent, Luke 13 and 3. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Now, I don't think I need to read into what that means. That's pretty simple, right? Acts 17 and 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Repentance is a decision to serve God that causes us to live differently. It causes us to reconsider our life choices. It causes us to reflect on the consequences of our choices. Repentance literally is an about face. It's a one 
80, Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Confess, I, I, I got this wrong. I'm going to change. I'm going to do this right. It's that simple. Forsaketh literally means to depart, leave behind, abandon, leave, forsake, let loose. Proverbs 28, 13 says in the NIV, whosoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. The ESV says, whosoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but whosoever confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Listen to Luke in Luke 24, 47, 48. And that repentance, and repentance, here's a problem. People just say sorry. And I get it. Sorry is a good thing. Repentance is turning around doing it different. He says that repentance and remission, that's important. Because that's exactly what Acts 2.38 says, but it tells you how. Oh. That repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name, in his name, in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witness of these things. Repentance and baptism. Repentance and remission baptism, the remission of sins. After I repent and I'm forgiven, I'm instructed that I need to go to the next step, which is a command, baptize me in Jesus' name. Baptize me in Jesus' name. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Notice there's, you can repent, but you still need to be baptized. He said repent and remission. He said, repent and be baptized. Baptism isn't a suggestion. Baptism isn't a waste of time. Listen, folks, believing is a beginning point, nothing more. I just taught this on about believing in enough. Did you know that the difference between believers and unbelievers is one thing? Who knows what it is? What? Okay, what is the difference between believers and unbelievers? Action. Doers of the word and not hearers only. How many know you need to pray through? How many of you do it? Easier said than, but doing is the, the word there. So there's a warning given. If I yell all to you and we're, driving, and we're all in a caravan of all our cars driving, I yell, the, from the side of the bridge is out. <laughs> How do I know who the believers are? Say it louder. That's right. Because if you don't believe the bridge is out, you're ignoring the instructions and you bypass baptism. You bypass obeying the truth. Four common misconceptions concerning baptism I'm going to cover. One, if I was baptized by a church, then I'm baptized. Wrong. The Bible teaches people to be rebaptized if they've never been baptized in Jesus' name. If you've not been baptized in Jesus' name, I love you. I appreciate you. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to say you haven't grown any. I'm not, I don't want you to be offended. But understand, if you haven't been baptized in Jesus' name, the Bible says you need to be rebaptized. Acts chapter 19, verses 3 through 5. And he said unto them, unto then, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Then Paul, Paul, face to face, kind of pretty good experience with Jesus there. Paul said, then said Paul, John rarely baptized with the baptism of repentance. But remember, we need remission. We need remission. Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard that, this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Look, it's not an insult to redo something correctly. The only thing that gets in the way of that is human pride. And God resists the proud. So what do I need? I need to get rebaptized. If I wasn't baptized correctly in Jesus' name, I need to be rebaptized. Mm -hmm. Many of you will have to redo it. Well, I'm okay because I was baptized as an infant. Wrong. Sprinkling waters on babies or even adults is not the way baptism was done in the Bible for two reasons. 
baptizo, baptism literally means to immerse in water, which is the portrayal of the burial of Jesus Christ. Are you understanding? Babies can't repent. I've got some adults that can't either, but babies can't repent, so they're not allowed or required to get baptized. Now, I got history, and it's been a long time uh, to back me up on this point. The Catholic Bible, and I used to have a copy of it. I used to have a copy of their encyclopedia where they changed it. And it says immersion was the oldest method employed. The World Book Encyclopedia said the early church practiced immersion or submerging underwater. The encyclopedic dictionary of the Bible, it is, it is evident that the action of performing of the baptism was immersion. It was changed by the Catholic Church. And I'll get to that in a minute. The Encyclopedia Dictionary of the Bible says, I already read that one. Okay, three. Well, I was baptized. I was baptized in the titles of Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So I'm baptized. Wrong. The only biblical form of baptism is in the name of Jesus Christ in your Bible. Now I know, well, Matthew 28, 19. Well, you need to understand. It says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing in them in the, that is singular. How many knows, how many past English 101? If you didn't, I understand that. That's okay. Don't be insulted. That is name. It doesn't say names. And besides that, there's no names given here. There are some titles given. The name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That is singular, not plural name. It's just one. So this is Matthew's account of the last command that Jesus gave his disciples before he ascended into heaven. It is, it is written in AD 62. So if you think about that, this is after the church has been baptizing in Jesus' name for 30 years. Matthew is writing to the Jews. He's teaching some theology. He's teaching that Jesus is the Father who created the world, the Son who walked among us, and the Holy Spirit who now dwells in us. Titles are not names. There's only one name in Matthew 28, 19. Furthermore, no one's being baptized there. And everybody around here knows I say that all the time. That's my first defense. No one's being baptized. So Jesus expects these disciples to fulfill his command and not just repeat it. And that's what exactly the apostles do. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And Peter said unto them, now if you go read it, everybody was there, even Mary was there. Now they're just like you. As you're standing there wanting to bump, wait a minute, you're done. No, no, don't say that. Nobody stood up and said anything to Peter. Peter's the one that had the eye lock with Jesus when he denied him. You can argue with the word. You can argue with me. You can go about your way, but I'm going to tell you something. You must be saved, and if you're going to be saved, you have to get baptized in Jesus' name. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There's the repent, and there's the remission. The remission is being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission. Acts 8 and 16 says, For as yet he was not fallen upon any of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 19 and 5, and I'll get in that in more in a minute. It says, And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 4, 10 through 12. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you when they healed the lame man before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you, builders. You rejected him, the religious leaders, which has become head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's such harmony here with what's going on. I'm sorry if you did it wrong. I'm sorry if your parents led you wrong. Don't get mad at them. Do right. Turn around and get it right. Peter preaching explains after the layman was healed and it says in Acts 4 and 8 just prior to this, Peter filled with the Holy Ghost and said to them, ye rulers of the people, ye elders of Israel. And he preaches that. He teaches that. 
Colossians 3 and 17 declares, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. The Catholic Encyclopedia, the Jesus name baptism formula, was changed to Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You find it in their second encyclopedia, page 263. The baptismal formula was changed from the name of Jesus Christ to the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by the Catholic Church in the second century. Why? They changed it so they can make everybody happy. Not God. People. Our human spirits get in the way, folks. Our attitudes, there are some that get mad and say, when's the last time you spoke in tongues? I asked that somebody one time, and boy, I could tell it had been a long time. <laughs> you can figure that one out. The most common misconception is this. Baptism is for church membership. Wrong. Nah. Baptism is for the removal or the remission of sins. It's an act of obedience. It's an understanding. Remember Saul, Paul, that road to Damascus experience? Listen, and I, there's a lot of sincere people, but many stop at experience. Oh, man, I felt the presence of God. They, they stop at the experience and miss the obedience. But if you read the story, Paul said, what would you have me to do, Jesus. He said, I'm going to send you. And then when he's done with that, he talks to another guy, and I'm going to send you. What is the difference between a believer and an unbeliever? They were believers. They both obeyed and did what Jesus said to do. Are you hearing me? Now, I believe that Saul and his experience on the road to Mass is pretty life-changing. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Wait a minute, I, I still have the fresh blood of Stephen on my hands or whatever. Wow, what have I done? But experience doesn't wash away sins. A wonderful feeling from God does not wash away sins. Feeling the Holy Ghost does not wash away Being in a wonderful church service, be, being around the people that does not wash away sins, only baptism in Jesus' name washes away sins. Only baptism in Jesus' name does that. Acts 22, 14 through 16 says, And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see the just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth, for thou shalt be his witness. He's talking to Saul, who becomes Paul. Listen, there's, man, you've got an amazing thing that happened to you. You had a wonderful experience. And now, why tarriest thou, Saul? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And this man became one of the most prolific Christians to ever live, writing 13 books of the Bible. Wash away thy sins. He talked to Jesus. He recognized his wrong, but he still needed to be baptized in obedience to wash away sin. He had to be washed. He had to have his sins washed away. Titus tells us, Paul speaking uh, in verse chapter 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. When's the last time you renewed it? Hey, heads of the house, you need to be looking around. How's your family doing with the prayer life? How's that going? Because when you stop and think about that question and you consider the ramifications, then you start dealing with what's in your home and should it be there? Or why you have, people don't, well, why do you have those rules? Well, those rules really aren't, aren't to keep people from anything. They're to save them from some things. But it's really hard to pray through in the Holy Ghost when you surround yourself with the garbage of this world. Mm-hmm. In the NIV, it says it this way. He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. That rebirth, that born again. Maybe, maybe we should go to John chapter 3 and read verses 3 through 5. 
when Nicodemus, marvel not that you must be born again. Colossians 2 and 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Baptism is our type of burial. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Colossians 2 12 of the ESV says it this way. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. When Paul speaks to the Romans in chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, he says, We are buried, therefore, with him by baptism unto death. I'm dying to my old self. I'm dying to my old ways. I'm turning my back on all those sinful ways in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's what it does. For we have been united with him in death. For if we've been united him in death, if we've been baptized, if we've been united with him in death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Mm. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Baptism is pretty important. Now all these are letters or epistles written to churches who've already understood the plan of salvation. There's no argument there. And we know that Peter, the very first church service, has, gives us the order. And Peter said unto them, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Everything needs to harmonize. Matthew 28, 19, harmonize with this if you looked at it correctly. If you look at it incorrectly, well, wait a minute, why are they baptizing in Jesus' name and the title's over here? Well, they're not baptizing anybody over there. <laughs> I can make this harmonize. But there's some of you, oh, I just don't see it that way. Well, if you're going to see it like it's real, you've got to see it that way. It's one and the same. It harmonizes, not contradicts. The ESV in Acts 2.38 says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Bible translations, and we got a lot of them today, use the words forgiveness and remission interchangeably because they're meant to be experienced together. You experience them together. It's almost like deciding what's the most important part to make an engine work. Well, in all honesty, there's a lot of things that have to happen together. Nobody denies that engine works when it all works. This works when it all works together. There's no such thing in the Bible as a Christian who was not baptized in Jesus' name. Consider it this way. And I don't mean to be hitting close to home here, but you've been warned. Pastor Cross said, you know what? I don't want no coffee, no soda pop, no gum in the church. Don't you bring it in the sanctuary. Don't you bring that in here. Well, let's say one day you did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And you spilled your drink. And there's a very noticeable stain on the chairs or the carpet or wherever you spilled it. Someone's pointing to one right now. <laughs> now, you confess, Pastor, I went against your instructions and I drank a soda in the sanctuary and I spilled it. And you, Pastor, I'm really sorry. And I forgive you. <laughs> I have to work on it. <laughs> you tell me, I'm sorry, I forgive you. And although I've forgiven you, every time we walk by, there's that stain. I walk by it, I'm trying to pray, and I see that stain. Every time you walk by, maybe coming up here to sing or do something, and you see, are you hearing me? It's virtually impossible to remove it. It's just no product. And we, we try and we do all we can. We buy all sorts of things and we 
and try to clean it. But every time someone comes in, oh, man, look at that stain. And you're like, oh, man, shut up. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You're in a crowd, and you're like, okay, well, they shut up already. Why am I going to keep pointing? <laughs> Everybody knows I did that. Pastor's going to have to go through that again. I still forgive you. <laughs> you know how you do. Or you get a dinger in your car. How about that? And you're like, oh, I warned them about that. And so every time you come around, there's an ugly reminder that you were once disobedient. There's a reminder that the church, every time they come in there, they see, oh, that's sister so-and-so sin, or that's brother so-and-so did that. Well, yeah, and there's that little giggle and that laugh. But deep down, it's like, it's an ugly reminder. You know, you actually disobeyed the pastor. And even though you're forgiven, you have a constant reminder. But then one day, one day, some new product comes out or you find a powerful solution that removes that terrible, ugly, perpetually reminding stain from the fabric and you're able to wash that stain completely clean and away. And the next time I come into the sanctuary, there's nothing there to notice. There's nothing there to remind me of that. It's no longer there. And even though I'd forgiven you, now I can forget. Oh, I can forget about that time. And soon it's not brought up. It's no longer mentioned. No one's making jokes or giving you jabs about it because it's forgotten. Because not only are you forgiven, now it's washed away. That's why the Bible teaches repent and be baptized and why forgiveness and remission go together because I'm forgiven and it's washed. I'm forgiven and it's, can we praise God for that? Can we thank God for that? That's why it works hand in hand. Thank God for both of them. I don't want to just come up and say sorry and I'm walking around a living stain. Wash me. One of the disciples, while Jesus was washing feet, he said, oh, no, not me, Lord. No, 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 you're too good. No, no except I wash you. Like, Just wash. We ought to have that mentality. I want to take on the name of you. I want to be baptized. I want to, I want to be baptized in Jesus' name. It's funny. I got people that won't be baptized right the first time. And you got people, can I be baptized again? I want to feel that again. <laughs> So obeying the commands of God to repent and be baptized in Jesus' name is our part of knowing we're saved. See, because here's the thing. If you were the joker that did that, and we kid around, but deep down you know, pastor's forgiving me, so you can say all you want. Mm -hmm. Right? But what qualifies us for God to do his part being filled with the Holy Ghost, getting that knowledge. I've been washed. I've, I've repented. I've been baptized. And now I know. Now I know it's all washed because he fills me with his spirit. Remember those people from Ephesus that were obedient to God's word and were rebaptized? How many know what chapter that is in Acts? You know, who knows our Bible? Thank you. 19. You realize what God did for them? And Paul in Ephesus, he, he happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus there. He found some disciples. What a respectful term. And said unto them, did ye receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Listen, nothing wrong with improvement. Nothing wrong with getting something a little better. Can I tell you something? Church is no place for ego. It's not, you need to drop your price. You know what? I really haven't prayed through. The best thing is honesty. I, I, you know what? I haven't spoken to, you know what? I haven't been a witness. I haven't, I haven't done a lot of things I'm commanded to do. The first way to start doing right is to acknowledge that you're doing wrong. Hello? And it doesn't matter how old you are. We'll all do with the flesh. They said, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. <laughs> Man, we ought to be so excited when we find people like that. Are you hearing me? And he said, 
Where'd he go first? Into what then were you baptized? If baptism wasn't important, why are the disciples bringing it up? They said unto John's baptism, and Paul said, John, he didn't down it. I'm not downing anybody's baptism. That's where you were at. Like Paul said in another place, nevertheless Christ was preached. I'm glad Christ was preached, but let me show you to you a more excellent way. Mm. He was baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. When you do your part, God always does his part. And you can know you are saved. There's no reason to wonder, no reason to wander. You can know the word. 1 John chapter 2, 3, and 4. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And he saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. John chapter, 1 John 4 and 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us his commandments. Spirit. Let's all stand. Are you ready to know you're saved? Are you really ready to know? Something happened in Acts chapter 10. And they have the circumcision, speaking of the Jews, which believed, were astonished. Acts chapter 10. As many as came with Peter, all those that came with Peter we're astonished because that on the Gentiles, we say that's us, also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, how did they know? Because a lot of people say, well, I got the Holy Ghost because I feel it. I've changed. That's not Bible. That sounds good. It sounds mystical. It sounds, yeah. But it's confusing because if some get it and speak in tongues and some don't, that's confusion. I know my engine's running because I can hear it run. It makes a sound. In fact, the other place it says, a, give it forth a certain sound. There's a sound and it matters. Because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And it says right here, how'd they know? For or because they heard them speak with Do you have the Holy Ghost? How do you know? I know how they said they knew in the Bible. Now, if you want to come up with a new revelation, that's not of God. I'm going by the word of God. I'm going by what it says. I want what Peter had, what Paul had. I want what the, I don't care. You come up with something new Galatians tells us that he or even an angel preach any other gospel. Let him be accursed. I'm sorry. I want to get in the word of God. Then answered Peter, because they're like, hey, wait, look, they got the Holy Ghost. Can any man forbid, any of you guys going to forbid that these should not be baptized? Peter wasn't leaving it out. Holy smokes, there's something amazing happening here. God just taught us something. If you knew I had a vision and God showed me something's going on here, that's why it's important to know your Bible. Can any man forbid that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. How'd they know? They heard him speak with tongues. And he commanded ooh, them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. I got it's, it's good to know. It's good to know. I've been washed. I've been reborn. No, I'm not perfect, but I can tell you, I know I'm saved. I've taken on his name and baptism. I've been, yeah, I've had sin in my life. I'm going to sin tomorrow probably. I'm going to say something, do something, but you know what? I can repent. I can be covered and washed by the blood of Jesus. But I'm going to tell you something. I must follow the plan of salvation and repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of my sins and I shall, 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 that's a continuum, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost.